What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from Zoom again, and this time we are here with Not. It is great to be able to talk with you guys. Thanks for being here. Well, cheers for having us. Yeah, thank you. It's great. Yeah, anytime, man. Anytime. I was just listening to your album, Hunt, and it is absolutely kick-ass. I can't wait for the rest of the world to hear it. It's coming out this Friday via Season of Mist. For people who may have only heard the singles, though, and not the full-length album, do you feel like songs such as uh, Unity of Opposites or Descent, etc., is a good representation of what this whole album is going to sound like, or is that just scratching the surface of what's to come? I guess a little bit of both, in a way. We tried to pick tracks that we thought had some of the archetype sounds of the album, I guess, so that, you know, you they set out the borders of where the album might be and where it might go, but then there's plenty of still new territory within the other tracks, I think. Um, so, yes, a little bit of they represent things, but they certainly don't cover the whole picture, I think is a, a fair way to describe it. Yeah, I'd say that um, we, t we chose them quite consciously as well with Unity, um, yeah, Damocles and Descent, uh, to, to represent different facets of the sound. Um, uh, especially with Damocles, because it's kind of new territory, you know, semi-new territory for us, I guess you could say. Um, we've had we've had songs previously in a similar vein, but not quite as uh, I don't know bombastic maybe as that, and um, slightly uh, moodier than some of the other output. But yeah, well, yeah, and uh, then the other stuff rocky so yeah <laughs> well uh with the making of this album was there sort of like a preconceived vision in a way where you maybe kind of like using the raise the lights ep as sort of like a foundation of where you would go in a way or was this a very like experimental songwriting process and kind of things just fell into place on their own yeah i think we never really approach writing anything with a right this needs to be like this we very much always just start with a couple of riffs and see where that takes us Obviously, the big difference we've got with this album, uh, past compared to anything past, is that we don't have a drummer anymore. We've got a drum machine, so that has forced us to try new things. And I think we've really tried to sort of branch out and go right. Well, we don't have to make this sound like a you know a kit in a room. We can do whatever with it. Let's see where that will take us. Let's see what we can do by having some things that might sound less than ideal with a drummer, but works with the drum machine. And then also we can't do certain things that maybe with a drummer would work, but sound a little bit out of place with the drummer's teacher. Yeah, it, it's forced us to be a bit more experimental and a bit more creative, but I think we kind of we always approach things with a degree of that anyway. I think I think that comes through because, well, I, I, working with limitations, I guess, in a way, and I'm always fond of that, be it in you know, artwork that I've done in the past or, or like performative stuff, or and especially in music. At the beginning, I think a limitation for me was that I've always been a bass player, so writing guitar and playing guitar even was a, was something to to sort of work on. And um, I quite enjoyed um, working in quite a stripped back way. I think I've got a bit more proficient as time has gone on, and maybe more so on this album. But um, I, yeah, I like limitations, and I think the drum machine in a certain way was was kind of limiting, but also kind of freeing in a, in a way because it makes us you know work in a in a slightly different way so yeah is it fair to say that maybe more doors have opened up in the future for not song right for songs in a way like did, did maybe taking this route open up new doors for what you can incorporate in the future uh 100 percent. you know i mean we've actually even just this afternoon we've been working yeah. on stuff for album two and there's stuff in that which without this album we'd never have done um because a as you say it's opened those doors and we've gone mm, okay let's see how much further we can push in this direction let's see what we can incorporate from what we learned here you know i think um we we're saying uh eight and three was a good track for that for us well you know ignoring the song in a way but what it forced us to try has then gone right okay well this worked this didn't work what else can we do so uh is every song kind of representative of, of, of a specific emotion that you were all feeling at that particular time? Is it coming from your point of view? Or would you say that not is more or less kind of like an escapism and you're utilizing more external sources of inspiration? Um, so when we write anything, uh, I think always the ideal is that by creating something, you're tapping into something that's within you that you might not necessarily even realize is there. There's you're kind of digging into that um, subconscious and trying to like pull out a meaning from that's buried within you somewhere. However, when you make a piece of artwork, it's always influenced by the world around you, what's going on, what you've just read, something you heard on the radio, and all that kind of stuff. And then when someone then views said piece of work, their interpretation is also influenced by their world their life up to that point the things that they've heard seen and, and what have you so i think it's 
come from us but it's also of the world that we're in um and yeah it's kind of that amalgamation of both it's how we feel but also how the world is at the time that we've made it i, I love to see it as a personally as like a fact finding mission in a way about myself and ourselves and mm -hmm. you know kind of like i call it the night side of of me it's the kind of the subconscious the you know the, the dream it's almost like tapping into dreams or the subconscious it's kind of like it's linked to magic with me as well the idea of like magic and music kind of about transportation and and travel and that's kind of where the nought the nought name comes from like wondering being a being a, a traveler um yeah so that the idea of going into yourself like if it's a magical ritual or if it's uh if it's making music then it's about diving into that and seeing what you come out with seeing what sort of the jewels or or thorns or whatever whatever it is that you kind of come back with mm -hmm. things to face or you know things to realize and mm -hmm. yeah and uh the knowledge that that kind of gives you yeah well yeah, definitely and that kind of activity is always shaped by you on that day the world yeah. on that day around you it's almost that scene and setting kind of thing that <laughs> mm. it's uh yeah so it, it's a little bit of both i guess yeah. well uh, you know inspiration whether it's coming internally or externally is you know it could be as it could disappear as quick as it comes in a way has it is it rare to say that for both of you whether it would be writing the lyrics or tra or uh, guitar parts in a way inspirate like inspiration tends to strike at the most inconvenient of times right yeah, it definitely can do. I, I think yeah. we've both said it. It's the washing up is the worst time. You're there. We're doing the dishes. Yeah, yeah. cleaning your dishes. And you suddenly <laughs> think, oh, man, that would be cool. The, yeah, to talk <laughs> of high and low, it's often the most mundane activities, you know, breed this, breed the sort of like, it's, it's strange, the, the sort of the, the, the fertile grain of that when you're thinking about these higher higher things. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's quite weird, but um, it's not lost on us, but it's quite humorous in a way and quite fun, you know. We, we're, we, you know we, we're in conversation a lot anyway. We talk to each other like yeah. every day we have done since we were at university together like 15 years ago or something yeah. and um yeah. yeah yeah but um yeah we're quite good now as well at um when that inspiration is they're just committing yeah. so for example you know today we were, we were writing and we go right you know what that's what we've come up with in the moment let's get it down record it down and move on rather than trying to like overwork it and sort of wear out the creative spark i guess exactly. so there's a tendency i think to do that you have a good idea and then you go oh but maybe it should be something else and you go back and forth and before you know it that initial thing is gone and you've spent yeah. hours fiddling around with something and probably made it worse than what it was at the beginning yeah if you're like ag agonizing over something and you know the, the, the multiple incarnations that that can take it kind of takes away from that spark so i think well obviously we work we work on stuff we don't just like record the first thing that comes down but it's um it's about trying to keep that spark um, the, the, the kind of you know if it raises the hair on the back of your neck i do have that and i have it on the top of my head but yeah so it's about you know it's about tapping into that and if that, if that's still there then um yeah that that's kind of what i'm after well i've always said it, it I, i'm it's funny to hear you say that like during the most mundane of tasks is where the inspiration strikes and my theory is it's just an essence of homeostasis in a way like your body shivering when you're cold as a means to warm you up sweating when you're hot as a means to you know cool you down maybe when you're in just the most mundane of tasks like you're working a boring job and then the greatest idea strike i think that's just your brain naturally reacting to the environment that you're in that's a really great a great way to uh yeah. describe that yeah that's yeah. i've not thought of it like that but that's that's pretty perfect i would say yeah definitely yeah. there's something almost weirdly meditative about quite a lot of mundane tasks because you do them on autopilot don't you so it must freeze you up to wander and to go hmm. What else could I be doing with my life other yeah. than vacuuming my house or something? Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I can only imagine, though, like, imagine if if somebody else cleaned the house that day, how many songs, great songs, we would never would have heard. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think artists like to, you know, kind of create a, an idea or, like, a kind of image of themselves as, you know, like, things are created in this kind of, like, hallowed space. But I think a lot of artists, if they're truthful with themselves, would, yeah, <laughs> would uh, would own up to that. Yeah, that's why I've always wondered why so many artists like to move to the city. I'm one of them. But, like, why so many artists like to live in the cities where there's, you know, so much going on. It's not really much of a mundane task in the city. Maybe that's why so many artists, when they move to the city to pursue their dreams, they get the most mundane jobs. Maybe. Yeah. You'd just be boring old fart sluggers and not go out. So. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, is not it, anymore. 
<laughs> because I feel like it's great to be able to talk with both the vocalists and the guitarists because I feel like both have the element. They work so well together, the vocals and the guitarists, but they also have their elements that make them stand out in a way. Like, I feel like if you were to separate the vocals from the guitarists, they also would have, they would stand very strong together on their own. Do both of you kind of need to be feeling the same emotionally and kind of be in the same headspace when writing music together in order to make each part sort of belong together or could maybe having different points of view or feeling differently actually help add to the not sound yeah so i think we've, we've just got quite attuned to the way each other think when it comes to music and stuff like that um so very much if i'm sort of coming up with something jack goes instantly yeah yeah you need to do that to it you need to tweak it this way all the other way around you know you'll be playing around with something on guitar and i'll be like actually if you maybe change the picking pattern on that a little bit or add an extra note there I can see how that whole song comes together. So it's it's a very neutral process, I guess, isn't it? You know, it's very much, I could, I'd always struggle to say who wrote mm. what riff on the album. Because sometimes like, well, I sort of came up with the bones of it and then you made it good or vice versa, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think we're more often than not in a very similar similar space with stuff and have a similar view on it. And do, what is it better to come up with ideas, whether it be for guitar parts or lyrics, when you're more alone in isolation, or is it better to sort of be in the company of your bandmates? Isolation is a great fuel for creativity, but I'd imagine human connection is also a great fuel as well. I guess, uh, I guess lyrically, it's more Gavin's domain. But like when we, uh, when we write, we, we we write everything. Every track is written instrumentally first and kind of structured, and we kind of yeah we look at it that way, and then the lyrics are kind of added after. And I think. You, you look at the, the music and the kind of the feeling that the music mm. might give you. It might just be one particular part of it or the song as a whole or the kind of mood that we're trying to create because I think we are trying to create, like, not soundscapes, but trying to create moods and, like, worlds within those songs. And then I quite like that you use that as the springboard then to um, spark an idea for, for lyrics. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and it's, um, it's funny because often the way the songs start is one of us will have just the tiniest seed usually a rough riff of some sort, maybe a keyboard part, a guitar part, or a bass line. And then we just build and build and build and grow that out into this pretty much fully finished piece with a bit of thought to, okay, this feels kind of a verse, this feels a chorus, maybe that keyboard part could be reinforcing a vocal melody, something like that. But then, yeah, as you say, then I, I kind of almost meditate on that music and go, right, okay, what's that? making me feel? What am I hearing in it? It's almost like I'm, I'm hearing the words in the song and then you pick those out of the air and go yeah okay that's my my theme that's my feeling and then you, you elaborate further from there so it kind of yeah we sort of are very collaborative and it, it, it starts as a joint thing and then it kind of goes off and, and, and gets refined of the, the lyrics afterwards really and that is as much as you said it's uh being on your own there and in that solitude kind of really helps so you can really focus on just the music and what's that saying in terms of the lyrical subject matter do, could a lyrical idea help dictate the direction of the sound of a not song or do, is music need to be present first before any lyrical idea could come to fruition yeah so personally i don't understand how people can write a lot of lyrics and hear a song in the lyrics i i have to <laughs> i have to have the music first and then put the song the words to it that being said, uh, what often happens, or, or certainly can happen, is we might have the single riff, the, the, that kind of genesis, and then I hear lines in that, and then we go, okay, right, great, that's the feel of the song. Let's build out the music to support that core element. Like the, you know, the track we were literally working on today started with that. We go, ah, oh, there's, there's vocals in that one riff, and then we build out to support that idea from that. So it can, but there has to be that, spark first which is always always going to be the music or the riff i think mm -hmm. um and could do you want uh not music to be open to interpretation or do you want like maybe the listener to be just as engaged with the meaning of the music as much as the music itself i think any artwork's always a mirror to a degree you know we can certainly put our vision and our intent into something but it's always going to reflect back at the listener what they want to get out of it as well you know we can maybe kind of shape what they're seeing to a degree but yeah their interpretation is always going to be their own because they're a, a unique individual the same as as we are who've written it uh, and i think there's a beauty in that so whilst yeah it's great when people do get the exact same thing that we get from it it's also really cool when you read some comments or, or review or whatever and someone has picked something completely out of the out of the blue and you think i didn't see that in it at all myself but i'm glad they have 
I've always been obsessed with great lyrics as well, so I'm, I'm, I always, <clears throat> I still do it now. If I buy a new album, I'll sit down and listen to the whole thing and I'll read through the lyrics, you know, just as I did when I was a teenager, you know. So that's really important to me. But also, I kind of, I can appreciate if someone, you know, just listen, just is into it for the music and not really the meaning behind it. That's also fine, you know. It's as long as people are listening to it, then that's that's cool. Yeah. Now, I, I didn't want to talk, we talked a, uh, about Hunted and promoted that in a way, but like uh, the Raise the Lights EP, because I love the track Disintegration and I'm Here and Frames, I feel like those are excellent tracks as well, you know, but, you know, I can't believe it's been quite a while now since 2018, but like, would would you say that that almost kind of paved the way of the direction Not would go in in the future? I don't know if that was the first time people first heard Not, if that was the first, like, real offering or concoction of songs that we heard but was that meant to be sort of like the starting point in a way that would lead to what we hear on haunted um i, I guess so i mean it's st- to be honest it started the band started with me and gav and um it was really just evening sharing riffs you know we we both like metal and kind of, i was playing in extreme metal bands at the time and uh, we met and we kind of found that we both loved kind of classic rock, so, you know, the bluesy stuff with like, the Doors, we really bonded over the Doors and Blue Earth to Court and Judas Priest and all sorts of ones. And then we were like, oh man, we both love goth stuff and no one else was really like liking it as much as we were. Um, yeah, so I don't, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, so, yeah, as I say, it's tough. I don't think there was ever an intent of, right, we're going to set the parameters of the band with it however i think what we hit on with those tracks was something that we really liked um yeah and so we've just been trying to almost uh carry on doing what we like basically we made songs that we listened to and thought if someone else made that i'd be really into it yeah let's just keep doing that you know i think initially in the early days around the time we raised the lights we were kind of a bit more not conscious of it but i guess we were conscious of it you know you kind of emulating your heroes a bit more maybe and um you know, we, we set out with, the, oh, these are the bands that we like because we bonded over them. And I guess the kind of music kind of followed that. I'm still really pleased with that, that, that the songs on that um, release. And we, we play quite a few of them live still. Um, but yeah, but it's what's, what I really love now is that when I pick up a guitar, um, because like I say, it's a relatively new thing for me. I'd only been playing for maybe properly like a year before we, we wrote and recorded Raise the Lights. Um, yeah, but now every time I pick up an instrument, I'm confident. I feel like the stuff that's coming out is is me, and it's kind of like it's this kind of weird. I love that it's a weird like bastard mix of post punk and metal and rock and and you know every, and everything. I love Tom Waits. I love you know we love Nick Cave, but you know I love throat singing and you know anything, all this stuff. And even though it might not come out straight away in in the music, you know hopefully it kind of comes through my fingers in a bit and and yeah adds to that sort of cocktail. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it's so because I, honestly I and I'm the journalist here and I don't know how to describe Knott's music in a way because one minute I'm hearing Rammstein then the next minute I'm hearing the Smiths and then the next minute I'm hearing him and then the next minute I'm hearing Depeche Mode like it just seems like it goes all around the spectrum I know it is like a rather cliche to ask like what are your inspirations but I think it's fair to say you guys take inspirations from all types of music right and not just metal yeah 100% you know and I think that's something which we take a bit of pleasure in was when you read people's comments and almost everyone says oh they sound like a different band you know what i mean you never get the same one twice or very rarely and i think that's that for me feels almost like a, t- a reminder that what we're doing is it's just us we're not we're not trying to go okay yeah we really like Bauhaus. it needs to sound like them by doing x y and z it is very much just a kind of a melting pot of all the things that we enjoy and we've, we've grown up with but um yeah i think the big ones for us really are absolutely yeah the, the ones you might expect in a way so about house killing joke sisters mercy it was an effort then uh, but then yeah when it comes to things like song structures and arrangement and things i think the doors are a really really big influence um then now that the drum machine is taking over the percussive duties yeah depeche mode tears for fears they're definitely uh, a big inspiration and then even stuff um like EBM bands like from 242, Nitsa Reb, that kind of stuff. I take some um, mm. inspiration from how they approach programming, sampling, that sort of stuff, you know. So there's a, absolutely a, a mixed bag of things in there. I see some fun interesting because it's. Oh, sorry. You yeah, saying? yeah. Uh, I, I find it interesting. I, I do not worry, but it's something I've thought about. Not, I don't really care about it now, but a little bit maybe when we've been writing the second album over the last few weeks as well. It's kind of, I worry that stuff might feel a bit schizophrenic and a bit kind of. And a bit not messy, but because I, I think the songs are good, 
but it's something to be conscious of when you have so mm. many influences. But yeah, it's, I think it's a blessing and a curse what you said about um, not quite being able to pin us down because I think that's great for, for a lot of people. And I, I love that. I love when bands like our, our friend uh, Henrik Palm, who gets it on one of our other releases, like his solo stuff, I think is you can't pin that down either. And I think that's amazing. And that's exactly what I want to achieve with music. But then in terms of marketing, or if you've got, you know, um, people reviewing or, you know, having to set these sort of like reference points for people just to even to start listening to you. I think that's that that kind of annoys me a bit and it's a bit tricky, but I understand why it needs to be done. But then hopefully people listen to it and, and hear it as good music. I don't know, <laughs> not schizophrenic, but we'll see. Yeah. Well, there's there was a couple of bands that maybe I thought like, for instance, one of your label mates, uh, Voyager from Australia, I feel like uh, has that because one minute they're having the heaviest guitar riffs that you would hear in like a Fear Factory or a Meshuggah song. And then they have like the synth wave aspects that you would see like and then uh, another band uh, a little more underground but uh you should, if you haven't heard of them check out this band called king crow they kind of reminded me a little bit of you guys in a way um really uh, interesting band but i think it's fair to say like i could see you do a tour with like a prog band i could see you do a tour with you know a real death metal band i could see you tour with a black metal band i think you could play in front of many different audiences yeah and i think our live performance helps <laughs> that as well because if, if we broadly basket ourselves in that post-punk world, some newer bands don't have that kind of punk energy anymore on stage. You know, there's a bit more kind of looking at shoes, playing the wrist, whereas we're not at all like that. We absolutely go for it. So I think that intensity kind of helps us fit in with some of those more extreme styles on a stage, because even though the music might be kind of different, the energy and the kind of impact that that performance has is, is in the same kind of realm should we say so yeah i think i think live in particular that certainly makes sense for us it's like billy joel singing for black flag <laughs> yeah <laughs> you wanted to add to that jack sorry no 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 yeah go for some bit of pretty well man. but when it comes to playing live is there just is there at all a similar energy that you channel into your live presence as you do when you're songwriting or are they two completely separate energies that are channeled into both I think I think I'm more conscious of trying. Uh, when we started writing, so uh, Razor Lights was the first thing. Sorry, going back to that point. Yeah, Razor Lights was the first thing we recorded down um, outside of like you know bedroom demos. Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I've just lost my train of thought. When it comes um, to the live show. Yeah. No. Um, yeah, I think it's more. I'm more conscious of it now, trying to bring that into the writing as as we're doing it now. Yeah. So it's um, but when we when we made Razor Lights, that was my point. Um, we we hadn't played live, so you know, kind of that that came first, and then the live thing came. And now now that we've been playing live, uh, we can kind of incorporate that energy. I think that was mm -hmm. my point. Yes. Yeah. yeah no, I, I agree with that actually. Once you got it out there. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I think understanding how much energy and kind of intensity we can bring to music now by having done that on a stage because it is different when you're in a, in a studio um to try and to try and bring that kind of intensity to stuff i think it now is easier to bring that intensity once you learn how to do it if that makes sense so when you're just doing it in abstracts in the studio you it feels forced but then once you've mm. done it live as a group you can then tap into those experiences and go ah yeah it's just like that again but instead of there being a, a whole you know room of people there's a, a microphone and a, and a brick wall in front of me but you can kind of still pull on that experience that energy and that kind of bank of sort of feelings that's in you so yeah i think we, we're quite heavy players like i'm quite a heavy i'm quite heavy handed and and andy who plays bass on the recordings i'm live he's he's quite a heavy bass player so no, no one tickles anything so it's yeah um yeah, that, that all adds to it as well because mm -hmm. it does. It comes through. It comes through yeah. in the sound, the attack on yeah. the strings, or yeah, or the attack in the you know the vocal. Well, well, the brain picking question is because in the end, what you are doing when you play live is you are taking the songs and you're just replicating them in a live <coughs> setting in front of people. So with the replicating element in there, is there really anything remotely creative about playing live? If you because there's no songwriting happening on stage. Yes, I think so. Um, for one thing, there's a degree of uh, creativity we have to approach with, right, well, how do we actually translate that convincingly? Because a lot of the songs have quite a few parts that we can't play all of them. So there's degrees of going, right, well, which bits are a little bit looser and more kind of improvised? Which bits are nailed down? Which bits do we incorporate on the drum machine and so on? So there's a, there's a degree of 
freedom with the songs because they don't have to be exactly the same every time. But also, I think the biggest thing you're doing is you're creating um, an energy and you're creating that interaction with the audience. That's the focus. Going back to Jack's point about music and magic, and I think songs and their performances are kind of almost ritualistic. So what you're doing is you're creating that ritual with the audience. You're building that engagement with them where you're creating an energy between you and the people watching you. So, yeah, it's absolutely a creative process. You're just creating something different, but with the same set of tools. It's kind of how I see it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I feel like the meaning of the song could also change when the audience is experiencing it too. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And you, you kind of feed off each other, I think, and that, that helps it take on its own own life. I mean, in the track Unity of Opposites, one of the principles of that is that you can kind of have something and you can revisit it, but when you revisit it, it's never going to be the exact same thing. You know, you can go to a place twice and you can stand in the same spot, but it's not the same experience. And I think songs are absolutely like that the recording that you've captured is one rendition of that song mm. that every time you play it it's its own unique thing as well as still being the thing that it always was and i think you know on a different night a song can mean a different thing to different people including the ones playing it you know so yeah 100 yeah. percent, it's an idea that i think we're very behind yeah i'm hoping that one day that there's a band with a budget where they can make a live album of every gig that they play just so people could see how different uh it is every single night yeah <laughs> It's like Neil Young. I think Neil Young is like, there's the archive, right? And um, they're discovering tape after tape after tape. It feels like that's what he had. Oh, really? Yeah, it's, pretty, it's pretty cool. It would would be interesting to hear, yeah. Mm. Like, yeah, definitely yeah maybe it. sometimes you think, oh, God, I wish I weren't recording that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, then, yeah. You, then you burn it. You, you watch it over, and then you burn it, or you release it. But uh, Yeah, I like to drink before I play in it. <laughs> yeah. I think, and you might need to drink more before you watch it, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so before we go, I want to thank you both so much for your time for such an awesome conversation. I uh, look forward to the rest of the world hearing this brand new album, Hunted. Just with the release of it, uh, is there just anything else that you would like to promote in terms of gigs or anything else you'd like to plug for the Not Camp? Uh, to be honest, I'd just like to say promoters, if you're out there thinking, oh, I could do with a band, book us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've, uh, we've got a, a festival in the UK coming up, Dominion. With uh, We're playing the same day as Sodom and Orange Goblin, so it's a very eclectic lineup. So it's, that's going to be a fun one. But um, apart from that, we're kind of waiting for confirmation on a couple of other festivals and hopefully a European tour in the autumn mm -hmm. um, with a with a headliner above us. But um, yeah, so uh, just, just, keep, just keep an eye on social media and all the regular usual channels and yeah, yeah. You'll, you'll hear about it yeah but thanks for having us it's uh, it's been it's been fun to talk anytime i shall bug the hell out of every promoter i know to bring you guys here to the states please do <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That'd, be, that'd be great <laughs> yeah, thank you so much everybody yeah. we are here with not hunted coming out february 24th via season of mist be sure to pick that up this is alex from heavy new york we will see you next time